uh, introduce Jasper Snoop, uh, or Jasper Snoop, uh, who's uh, joining Harvard as a, as a service fellow. Um, Jasper has a really interesting background. He uh, is Dutch, but essentially grew up in the, in the US, and he did his, uh, his undergraduate and graduate work at the University of Toronto in, in computer science. He uh, uh, spent most of his graduate work doing really interesting stuff at the interface between machine learning and assistive technology, and in particular made a lot of, did a lot of sort of really, uh, sort of a lot of really cool stuff, essentially in trying to develop te technology to deal with uh, increasingly aging uh, populations. So things like stroke rehabilitation and detecting falls on stairs using computer vision and, and machine learning technology. Um, but along the way, he also has really been making deep contributions to uh, to machine learning. And, uh, and and since he's come to uh, and since he's come to Harvard, just in a month and a half, he's he's been exploring this this kind of more recent work on, on Bayesian optimization. And, and I've just been blown away with the sort of the exciting number of, of collaborations, both sort of within CS and Cs, but also in the broader Harvard community and, and MIT as well, uh, thinking about how to, to apply machine learning techniques to, to exciting uh, problems in the broader sciences. So welcome. And, uh, OK, thanks, Ryan. Uh, can you guys, can everyone hear me OK? Yes? OK, so today I'm going to talk about Bayesian optimization. Um, I attacked it from the perspective of machine learning. So I was really interested in how to make machine learning more efficient and more accessible. Uh, what I'm really hoping is that all of you here will, as I'm explaining this in the context, context of machine learning, realize that there are a lot of problems in various areas of science that exhibit kind of the same flavor. Um, and then I'm really, really hoping that some of you will say, oh, I have a really high impact project that has parameters that need tuning, and your method would be, would be great for that. All right, so like Ryan said, I started out in assistive technology. I was known as the machine learning guy in an assistive technology lab. And in this lab, I was just basically bombarded with questions all the time of the flavor, how do I get my machine learning model to work? Uh, how can I set the C parameter in an SVM? How can I set the number of hidden units in a neural net? Uh, or what does this L2 parameter mean in logistic regression? Um, and so then a very pertinent question for me, um, especially for, for my time, was how can we make machine learning more accessible to researchers in other fields? All right. So after a lot of searching, and actually a lot of hacking on machine learning algorithms myself, I came to the conclusion, or we came to the conclusion, that one of the really big problems is that every machine learning algorithm has a whole slew of hyperparameters. So I dare you to come up with a machine learning algorithm that has no hyperparameters. Any takers? No. All right. So, when I say hyperparameters, I mean any kind of high-level metaparameters. So things like um, regularization parameters, capacity of the model, um, anything that can be tuned or tweaked to affect performance, but is not something you can compute gradients for. <laughs> oh, sure. Okay, so anything you can kind of adjust to affect the performance. But people generally kind of sweep under the rug how they, how they do it. Um, and so I came from Toronto. And there, the, the kind of machine learning hammer is neural nets, um, especially more recently in deep learning. Deep neural networks have become really, really exciting. Uh, but the main criticism of deep nets is that only a select bunch of experts can actually get them to work because they have so many of these meta parameters. Um, so, for example, a deep net with three layers will have separate parameters, basically, for each layer. So each layer will have a different number of units, so different capacity, different regularization parameters, um, different optimization parameters, and so on. And so it's not uncommon now to have 30 to 40 parameters for, this, for these models. And then it becomes extremely difficult to find any kind of principled way to, to tune these. So we asked the question, what is the way people currently do parameter tuning in machine learning? 
And it really turns out to still be a black art. So people do it through expert intuition. You ask the local expert on deep nets what your momentum and learning rate should be. Um, people do grid search. So that's essentially gridding out a whole set of points in all dimensions and then doing a highly nested for loop, um, which is extremely inefficient. And you can imagine in 40 dimensions, becomes intractable very quickly. Uh, random search is actually guaranteed to converge to the right result, but you can imagine it'll take a really long time. And then my favorite, a uh, really prominent machine learning professor told me that he likes to do grad student search. Uh, so he gets a grad student, gives them a model, gives them a parameter range, and says, good luck. Here's a bunch of coffee and a stipend, and find me a good result. <clears throat> and so we thought, why not frame this as an optimization problem instead? <coughs> and so the idea is we can actually perform a regression from the high-level model parameters to whatever error metric that you're interested in. So classification error or root mean squared error if you're doing reg regression. Um, and then we can build a statistical model of this function to try to understand what exactly this function is from parameters to, to loss or cost or error. And so a really nice tool for this is a Gaussian process, is a statistical distribution over functions. And when we have that, we can use statistics to tell us things like, where do we expect the minimum of the function to be? And what is the expected improvement over the best we've seen so far if we try a new set of parameters. <clears throat> and so this is actually a paradigm that was proposed a really long time ago in the 70s in the Soviet Union. Um, it's known as Bayesian optimization, so a methodology for globally optimizing expensive, multimodal, noisy, black box functions. And the idea is you incorporate a prior over functions, Combine the prior and the likelihood with some observations. And then you can evaluate the posterior over functions and use that posterior to evaluate your uncertainty and how good a next experiment would be. Um, and in Bayesian optimization, we have a function that tells us how good the next experiment will be, which we call the acquisition function. <clears throat> so I apologize for for hitting you with a whole bunch of math on this slide. Um, but essentially what I want to convey is Gaussian process is a distribution over functions. Very recently, we've, in machine learning, established really nice ways for using Gaussian processes to establish distributions over various kinds of, of functions. Um, and the really nice thing is that the posterior mean, so the expected value of any output given a set of observations is analytically tractable, so it's really easy to compute. And also the uncertainty, so it tells us the uncertainty about any expected value that we can compute. Um, the intuition of Gaussian processes is essentially really simple. So it's a prior over smooth functions, where the idea is that any set of inputs that are similar will cause a similar set of outputs. And so if you think about setting parameters in machine learning models, you would imagine that as you interpolate over your parameters, you can also kind of interpolate over the error that you, that you get from those parameters. And so a Gaussian process we can use to draw samples of functions. So it's a prior. Um, the green line is the mean. The uh, variance is the blue section there. And then the blue lines are samples from this distribution. So we can easily sample from this distribution and draw possible functions that fit our, fit our data. And so here, now we have three observations, the red dots. And so once we get observations, we can update our model, get the posterior, and that changes the distribution over functions. Um, so now functions that pass through our data become much more likely. OK, so now we have this amazing tool, the Gaussian process, which gives us a mean and an uncertainty, um, given some observations. Now what we do is we perform a proxy op uh, optimization. So we could think of the Gaussian process as being a surrogate over the, uh, over the problem that you want to estimate, so the problem where you want to find the minimum. Um, and so with the, with the mean, it's essentially a regression. 
And then with the variance, you can estimate, well, how uncertain am I about places I haven't seen yet? And so the idea is that we will explore by seeking places with high variance and then exploit by looking at places that have a low mean. And so in general, Bayesian optimization kind of iterates by trading off these two things. So exploring places that we don't really understand and exploiting by trying to find places that we think are going to be really good. Yes? Technically, yes. Um, so, so Alice said, don't Gaussian processes also have hyperparameters that you need to tune? Um, yes, Gaussian processes are known as a Bayesian non-parametric model, um, which is a little misleading. They don't have any parameters that you kind of have to optimize directly. Um, I, guess, I guess there are some that you can, but in our approach, we integrate them all out. So all of our Gaussian process parameters, we integrate out. Um, following a Bayesian methodology. And so we essentially don't have any parameters except the choice of what the similarity metric is between points. So the covariance in the Gaussian process is the thing that decides how similar inputs are going to induce similar outputs. Um, and that's kind of a categorical choice that you, ha you have to make. But it, it's, it's pretty simple. And we've explored a whole bunch and kind of have come up with a very general one that you don't really need to worry about. How does the Gaussian process plot cells and really high numbers of bands? Like you showed the one dimensional function. Oh, yeah, sure. So, is that tractability to like 10 dimensions? So, the Gaussian processes scale essentially cubically in the number of dimensions in terms of computation, um, quadratically in terms of memory, uh, although there are a lot of recent efforts to speed that up. So sparse Gaussian processes, for example, scale much more nicely. Um, but yes, yeah, so the computational cost of estimating a Gaussian process is, is non-trivial. Um, and that's why this is really kind of, um, kind of justified for expensive experiments. So if you have an experiment that you can evaluate, an analytic function that you can evaluate really quickly, maybe it doesn't make sense to use expensive uh, Bayesian machinery to try to estimate the function. Um, but if you have anything that takes more than a few seconds or a couple minutes to evaluate, then it makes total sense. All right, so there's a really rich literature of acquisition functions. So the acquisition function is generally a heuristic function that we apply to our Gaussian process, uh, fit to our data, which tells us what um, what experiment we should run next. So it gives us kind of a score of how good the next experiment will be. Um, and essentially, hopefully, trades off this exploration, exploitation criteria. And so a really simple one you can imagine is probability of improvement. So if I pick a new experiment, I can estimate what is the probability that I'll do better by running an experiment um, with those inputs. Uh, and then one that I really like, the expected improvement, is how much can I expect to improve over the best I've seen so far by running an experiment at these new set of parameters? Um, there's a really interesting literature defining various kinds of acquisition functions. And there's actually a student, so Mike here is really interested in doing research into developing new ones um, for specific cases. But I won't dwell on that too much. So here I'll give you a little demo of how Bayesian optimization works. Um, so we've got two observations. Our predictive means, so our expected value at every input is that black line. Our predictive variance, so our uncertainty over any point in the space is that blue, so this light blue uh, fill. And then this red dotted line is function we're trying to minimize that we don't know a priori. Then in the bottom, I've plotted the expected improvement for every input for running an experiment at that point. And so basically, we iterate. So we run an experiment according to which one has the highest expected improvement, evaluate an experiment at that point, then 
fit that point to our Gaussian process, update our model, and then iteratively repeat this, essentially exploring our function, but not spending too much time at bad inputs um, and spending more time at, at good inputs. And so eventually, once your budget runs out, yes, David. Um, so I'm imagining that in some applications, you care about the performance while you're running and some you don't. Uh, and I assume that affects the acquisition function that you use, is that right? Um, but presumably, you, know, you generally would explore more if you're not worried about the online performance while you're, you're doing that? Oh, yeah, sure. So I guess if, if it's cheaper, um, then you would want to explore more. Sure. Um, if it's really expensive, then yes, most likely you don't want to explore much. Uh, so yeah, some of the problems that we've been looking at, um, and some really problems that I've been confronted with, are machine learning models that take on the order of hours to days to even one problem that takes a couple weeks to run a single time. And so in that case, we want to really be very, very efficient in terms of the experiments that we choose to run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, so fitting the Gaussian process is the bottleneck. Um, and so each time you fit the Gaussian process or you evaluate something with it, it has this, this cubic time property. Uh, in practice, so far, I haven't had a problem with this. The reason being that uh, so after you get to a couple thousand experiments, then the cubic complexity starts to really become a problem. Uh, so far, in terms of all the kind of expensive problems that I've come across, we've never been able to get to that many experiments. So generally, we get to on the order of 50 to 100, 200 experiments, maybe if it's a fairly cheap problem. Um, so so far, I haven't run into that. Although we are looking into ways to scale things up, and there's some really exciting ideas <laughs> floating around. All right. So now I thought I'd give a a quick kind of kind of funny um, example, pun intended. So this lends itself really nicely to a lot of puns. Um, when I was really excited about Bayesian optimization, uh, a PhD colleague of mine, Danny, challenged me. He said, if your Bayesian optimization is so good, I bet it can't boil me the perfect soft boiled egg. <laughs> and so of course, I took his challenge. And we bought two crates of eggs, or three crates of eggs, a lot of eggs, got a burner. And we spent an afternoon optimizing the boiling of, of an egg. Um, and so we came up with some parameters. So the boiling time, I think it was between 1 and 12 minutes. Cooling time, so after boiling the egg, we threw it in some cold water for between 0 to 5 minutes. We added some salt, 0 to 10 pinches, and some pep pepper, 0 to 10 pinches as well. And we set about optimizing his egg. Um, I think this is a really nice example to, to kind of show how the Bayesian optimization proceeds and kind of what the properties are and how it, how it works. So on the left there, I'm only showing two dimensions of the problem. So there are essentially the two interesting dimensions, boiling time and cooling time. Um, and that's the expected value, so the, the mean of the GP. Um, so that's kind of what our statistical model thinks the function looks like. And then on the right, I'm showing the average score that Danny gave to the eggs per iteration. So hopefully, we'll see this go up. You can see that after five eggs, um, he's not very happy. Uh, there's, there's not very good eggs thus far. Um, <laughs> I, I, guess you could, I guess you could reduce noise by boiling multiple eggs. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so remember, the Bayesian optimization knows nothing about the function space. And so at the beginning, it only explores. And so it explores generally at the boundaries first, because that's where the highest uncertainty is. And so I proposed him some bad eggs. He actually refused to eat that, uh, that two-minute <laughs> egg. It still gave it a bad score. 
All right, so after another five iterations, it's done a lot more exploring and it's learning much more about what the function actually looks like. So you can see now around the six minute mark, there's a big dip. Um, so it thinks the good eggs are in that region and it's clearly realized that uh, the, uh, the zero to two minute mark uh, is, not a, is not a good egg space. Okay, so now as we kind of understand what the function looks like, we can iterate. And you see that now it's discovered kind of the four minute mark. Um, and so this was really getting to the, the soft boiled egg territory. One thing that's really interesting is that it starts to find out that the space is very multimodal. So the four minute mark marks really good soft boiled eggs. And then around the eight minute mark, there's a dip that represents the good hard boiled eggs. Um, then you can see it also kind of keeps exploring later on. So it kind of figured out a lot of the good space and now it's looking in a, in a bad space. And then finally, after about 25 eggs, Danny got his ideal soft boiled egg. So it was kind that's hard on the outside. And then when you cut it, the yolk just kind of, kind of flows out. And so he was really happy about that. Um, Although this, this example is, is funny, I think it's a really good example to kind of show what's, what's going on in the Bayesian optimization. And what's really interesting is that through a statistical model of the function, we can learn a lot more about what our space is actually like. So we learn that the cooling time is essentially kind of useless. Um, so it doesn't make sense to cool the egg. We thought it would harden the yolk a bit more. But that didn't really work. Um, and so it's learned that as you cool, it, the egg gets a little bit worse. Um, but you can see that the sensitivity to cooling time is really, is really low. It essentially doesn't change the manifold very much. Whereas the sensitivity to boiling time is super high. And so a really nice thing that you get out of the Gaussian process as well is that as you're doing this, you're doing a sensitivity analysis. And so you can figure out what is your sensitivity to the various parameters that you're optimizing. OK. So in going back to machine learning, yes? That's a really good question. So yes, it's totally noisy. Um, and so we have a noise term in our Gaussian process. And so we try to estimate what is the, what is the measurement noise. Um, obviously, Danny is not a perfectly smooth function in terms of his tastes. Uh, so yeah, it's noisy, but the Gaussian process can account for, for some measurement noise. Yeah. All right, so we set out to do this for machine learning algorithms. And at the last uh, NIPS conference, so a major machine learning conference, we published a paper where we showed um, that you could do really well tuning the hyperparameters of machine learning algorithms um, following Bayesian optimization. And we really spent a lot of time trying really hard to get this to work well for machine learning problems. Um, so one thing we did was integrate out the, all the parameters in the Gaussian process, um, really thought carefully about what the appropriate measure was, so the similarity metric between ex experiments in machine learning, and then had to come up with a methodology for how do you actually optimize the expected improvement uh, in the Gaussian process. Uh, and then there's a lot of kind of design decisions there as well. A neat thing that we thought about was accounting for additional cost. So in the context of eggs, you can imagine that in the time that you boil a 12 minute egg, you could have boiled any number of much cheaper eggs. Um, so you could boil a whole bunch of three to four minute eggs, right? Uh, instead of a whole bunch of 12 minute eggs. And so all else being equal, you'd rather focus on the, on the cheaper eggs. And in terms of machine learning, that's true as well. So if you can run a small set of really expensive experiments versus a large set of much cheaper experiments, then all else be, being equal, you'd much rather run the cheaper experiments. And so we spent some time thinking about acquisition functions to take this, this cost into account. And so what I'm showing here is optimizing a logistic regression, so just optimizing the hyperparameters of the logistic regression on some uh, benchmark data set. And then if you take the cost into account, you can actually find a better result in much less time. So this is a result that I'm really 
kind of proud of and excited about because it beat the neural net guys in, in Toronto. Um, and so this is a convolutional network. It's the state of the art in object detection right now uh, on a benchmark object detection or object classification task evolving nine parameters, so more parameters than you can imagine tuning by hand um, <clears throat> in any kind of principled way. And this line represented the state of the art at the time. So this was actually the guy who wrote the code who is known as being the de facto expert in setting parameters of convolutional networks. And we decided, well, if we could just match him then that would be great. Then we could give our software with a convolutional network to somebody who doesn't know anything about convolutional networks, and they could get it to work well. Uh, and so we set it to run, and actually overnight, it beat him by quite a margin. And we got the new state of the art, which was really, really fun. Uh, and then when we took cost into account, it, it even beat him by about five, five hours faster, or a few hours faster. And so these guys were really interested in what the model actually found, um, which turns out to be extremely non-trivial uh, pretty much all the time. So it came up with numbers that basically you would never find by hand or through a grid search. Um, and certainly, you wouldn't report them in a publication if you didn't do it in a way that was, was really principled. All right, so now going kind of back to, yes? Uh, what happens to the generalization error? <laughs> oh, so this, this is uh, a validation set. Yeah, so yeah, you always want to optimize on a validation set. And then after you've done the whole optimization, you evaluate on a test set. Uh, I'm not plotting the, so the generalization error, but it's pretty close to the test error. So we beat the test error by about the same margin. Um, so that's a really good point. You can totally overfit if you do this optimization procedure on a small validation set or a, a not a well-picked validation set. Yeah. The other alternative to compare is to randomly search for some interesting using some randomly assigned Yeah, so, so you compare it I actually compared to, yes, I compared to random search on this problem because that was something that was proposed uh, around that time. I didn't plot it on this graph, actually, because it messed up the scale. So it was, it was way up top. And so the, the scale looked so bad that you couldn't actually see the difference between those three other lines. Um, so yeah, I, I did random search. Um, some people still do random search. But I don't think it's a very principled approach. All right, so now getting back to um, there was a question about, well, could you boil multiple eggs at the same time? Um, yes, so if you're boiling eggs, then certainly you almost always have multiple burners. So you may have four burners or six burners. Ideally, as you're boiling eggs, you would run maybe four eggs at the same time or two eggs at the same time. So we thought about how do you parallelize Bayesian optimization? And in the context of machine learning, the analogy is that you have multiple cores or multiple processors, and you would like to run experiments in parallel. And so we worked out a way to essentially integrate over all currently running experiments to pick the next best experiment to run. So for all likely values, uh, all likely um, results of the currently running experiments, what is the next best experiment to run after that? Um, and so this can run experiments asynchronously. So if you are boiling a 12-minute egg and a 3-minute egg, 3-minute egg may come back, give you a result. You can update your model, integrate over the result that you think you'll get for the 12-minute egg, and then pick a new egg and start, start boiling that one. And so the experiment we used to, to demonstrate this is an online LDA, so latent to Richelieu allocation is a topic model. Um, on Wikipedia articles. So this was a data set, I think, of 200,000 articles. So it's a fairly large data set. Um, and we repeated exactly the search that the authors who proposed this method um, did. And their search took 60 to 120 CPU days to do. So they did a grid search. 
each experiment takes five to 10 hours to run. Um, and so the whole grid search took 60 to 120 CPU days. And we showed that if we did a Bayesian optimization, we could get the same result as them. Actually, we showed that we could get a better result than them, uh, serial, we, serially within 10 days. And then if we parallelized three times over, we could get that result within six days. If we parallelized five times over, we could get that result within four days. And then 10 times over, we could get that result in two days. And so this is massively more efficient than doing this extremely expensive grid search procedure. Uh, yes, so two parameters pertain pertaining to the, the learning rate and one pertaining to the batch size, I believe. Yeah. No, no. So that's, that's what they did in their paper, and so we decided not to, we wanted to be able to compare directly to what they were doing. Yeah, so left out perplexity. <coughs> yeah, so that's a really good point. Um, so Gaussian processes generally are defined on stationary functions. And so things that have, for example, a, a exponential decay which occur very, very often are non-stationary. And so for a long time, we suggested that people would log transform their data. Um, so optimize in log space. We actually have just submitted a paper where we automatically learn what the transformation should be. Uh, I won't actually talk about that uh, in, in this talk. But yeah, so now we're, we're automatically learning, should you be doing a log transform or should you be doing uh, an exponential transform? Um, which is really actually really interesting for a kind of post hoc analysis of, of the parameters as well. Um, so that's kind of just happening in our framework. Uh, but, but yeah, so I think there's a lot of really interesting work still to be done. So yeah, when you're doing things in parallel, then maybe you want to be more intelligent about what set of experiments that you're running concurrently. Uh, yes, so you could do the grid search in parallel. That's why I said CPU days. Um, it takes a lot of computational power to do this grid search but you could do it in parallel. Um, yeah, so I guess that's, yeah, that's why I, I'm saying CPU days. One thing that's kind of interesting is that when we went off the grid, so this is just comparing to picking points off the same grid. When we went off the grid and said we can take any points within this space, we actually beat this result by, by quite a bit um, as well. Okay, so then there's some extra benefits to doing this Bayesian optimization <laughs> procedure. Um, of course, with a statistical model, you can really start to understand your space. You can understand dependencies between parameters. You get a sen sensitivity analysis more or less for free. Um, and you can figure out which dimensions don't matter, or which ones really matter for your problem. Um, one thing that I really believe in is comparing problems on an even baseline. So in terms of machine learning, what happens really often is people will try a lot harder setting the parameters on their problem than setting the parameters on some baseline that they're comparing against. Yeah, so this, this is definitely a, a, a major problem in machine learning. And so if you do a Bayesian optimization on both problems, now you've evened the playing field um, and you get a much fairer comparison. Uh, the research is totally reproducible. So if you just report one result and say, I got that result by adjusting things by hand, uh, it's totally not reproducible. But if you say, I, did, I followed some principled methodology for optimizing these parameters, I can tell you the sensitivity to each dimension, and so on and so forth. Uh, it leads to a lot more reproducible research. And then, of course, the reason for doing this in the first place 
we can hopefully make machine learning much more accessible to people in other fields. All right, so I'll briefly plug, um, there's a couple of researchers doing similar things, so following maybe less Bayesian strategies, but really interesting strategies for setting parameters in machine learning models. And the three of us are really involved in a Bayesian optimization workshop that I'm organizing at uh, Neural Information Processing Systems uh, this winter. And then we're proposing a workshop where we're going to compete. So we're going to set up a competition for the automatic tuning of hyperparameters and machine learning models. And so this is kind of the end of the first part of the talk. Uh, I'd really like to still show you some, some example applications that I've worked on and that we're working on. Um, but this was work with Ryan and Hugo La Rochelle in, uh, in Sherbrooke. The really nice error bars that we got were due to Amazon, uh, who gave us a, a really nice grant for computing. And all of our code is online at BayesianOptimization.com. So I've, we've developed a, an online code repository uh, that you can just download, and you specify your problem, and you write a wrapper either in MATLAB or Python, and you can run it, and it will distribute experiments even on a cluster in parallel. Uh, running your experiments iteratively according to the algorithms that I just described here. Um, it's really neat, so a lot of people are using that, and actually some, some major companies are already picking it up. So I'm very briefly going to plug, yes, Salu. Uh -huh. So you mean you could consider using Bayesian optimization to optimize, for example, the weights in a, in a regression or in a neural net or, or something like that. Yeah, so I've, I've tried that. The Bayesian optimization, because it's fairly expensive, so these kinds of algorithms, um, generally you can tune the weights, you can work out gradients, and the gradients will help you find the minimum much faster. Um, but also, you need to adjust these parameters, so it's, very, it's generally a much higher dimensional problem. And you can imagine that the number of times you would have to evaluate a higher dimensional problem will grow probably exponentially in the number of dimensions. Um, and so in terms of, for example, adjusting the parameters of a deep neural net, which now these things have up to a million parameters or more, um, you would need something exponential in a million to figure out what each dimension does. Um, unless you did something really interesting to, to lower the dimensionality. Uh, and so the answer is essentially that this is still a little bit slow for those problems. Um, and then a kind of a gradient-based solver, a gradient-based optimizer would find a, a better result faster. Um, hyperparameters are really interesting because it's a super noisy problem, so it's generally non-deterministic. Um, and you don't get gradients, so you, you generally don't know exactly how you should tune them. It's basically always multimodal, um, so it's certainly never, almost never a convex optimization problem. Um, and so that's what makes this kind of a really nice tool for, for that space. All right, so I'm going to give a really quick plug for our latest paper called Multitask Bayesian Optimization, where the idea is that if you're doing Bayesian optimization on multiple related tasks, then ideally you would like to share information between those tasks. Um, and for example, if you've already run a Bayesian optimization on one problem, so maybe I've boiled eggs for Danny, and now I have another friend who wants to get the optimal soft boiled egg, but he has slightly different tastes, although the error manifold is going to be super related. Um, and so this work is all about how can we transfer knowledge from one Bayesian optimization to another. And a really neat kind of example is big data. So what if you can, 
query a really cheap problem, so a problem maybe with a much smaller data set, to kind of bootstrap your really large data problem. So the same algorithm, maybe you would figure out what the parameter space is like on a small data set and use that to transfer over to a, a larger data set. And so we showed that you can actually dynamically query the smaller data set uh, to explore the larger data set and get the same result much faster. OK, so now I'll briefly talk about uh, applications. Um, so I've got a whole set, but I think I'll skip over a bunch. Um, but essentially, any, exper any experimental procedure that is kind of a, has a trial and error flavor, and there are many of these, um, can generally be optimized using Bayesian optimization. Um, and I'm sure some of you have ideas, hopefully already, of, of stuff you'd like to try it on. And so I have a whole slew of applications in assistive technology. Um, I think I'll just list them for now because I really want to tell you about what I'm working out here at Harvard. Um, but we, uh, we worked on automating uh, rehabilitation, so building a robot for rehabilitation and tuning that using Bayesian optimization. Um, we tuned a classifier for cancer detection, cancer classification. Uh, this is really exciting, so a fall detection system we had a camera sitting on a roof, looks down at people as they walk around in a house, and tries to detect if they've fallen down. And then there's a neat speech recognition system that starts a dialogue with them when, the, when it thinks that they've fallen down. Um, the speech recognition system is very complicated. So it is, involves a lot of various levels of computer vision. So there's a background subtraction, optical flow computation. Um, there are camera parameters that you need to set. And then at the end of the day, everything's stuck into a classifier, and it tries to classify falling from not falling. Um, and so to tune all of the parameters of all these various things, we used the Bayesian optimization procedure. And it actually worked amazingly well, uh, which was really neat. It did something that was totally counterintuitive, which was kind of fun. It basically turned the, the background subtraction, so how quickly the, a, an object walking around blends into the background, turned that into a, a fall detector. Um, so it said anything moving faster than a certain speed uh, would indicate a fall. It was, it was kind of fun. Uh, and then there was an application on prompting older adults with Alzheimer's disease uh, using a POMDP kind of model, so a, a decision process model. All right, so now I can, I can talk about what I'm working on here at Harvard. Um, so we've started a collaboration with uh, Sangbei Kim and Haewon Park at MIT. And they've built this really exciting robotic cheetah, uh, this guy here. Um, I got to visit their lab and, and see it. It's, it's really cool. It's big. It's like this big. Um, and they really want to get this cheetah to run like a real cheetah does, um, and very quickly. <clears throat> and to do that, they have some very complex dynamics. Um, so kind of a high-level dynamics of how should the different legs move with respect to each other, and then low-level dynamics trying to figure out, for example, is a certain leg in the right position at any given time? Uh, and it needs to do that in real time. And this relies on a set of hand-tuned parameters as well. And what's kind of neat is that they've built a physics simulator where they can stick in all the parameters the dimensions of the robot, um, come up with a potential ground, so a, a surface, and then simulate the robot running. And they want to basically have the robot run as fast as possible from point A to point B without falling down. Um, and so yes, it can fall down, which adds a nice, interesting additional flavor to the Bayesian optimization problem. There's kind of a, an interesting constraint boundary that we don't know a priori. And so we've done something really interesting where we've built a constraint classifier alongside the, the Bayesian optimization procedure where we try to estimate, as we get results back, where is this constraint boundary. The constraint boundary is super noisy as well. So it, it's actually a Gaussian process classifier trying to figure out where, where are the invalid regions of space that the, that the cheetah is going to, to wipe out. OK, so now I'm going to do a little show you a little demo of 
what this looks like. Yeah, you can see by the name that, that it, it started out not, not so great. So <clears throat> I can slow that down a bit. So the simulator is a lot more, more complex than this. This is just a, a simple video that we get out of it. Um, <laughs> But you can see choosing the wrong parameters for this cheetah leads to some, leads to some bad but hilarious results. <laughs> um, kind of frustrating in the beginning. I've got a lot of these, these wipeout videos. <laughs> they look better in slow motion, don't they? <clears throat> and so I set the Bayesian optimization to essentially optimize this cheetah. Um, so after a while, it starts doing much better, although it's still, <laughs> still wiping out every now and then. Um, but then finally, I guess you can infer what what happens here. Um, but then finally, essentially, I, I ran the optimization for a night, came back the next day, and this is what it came up with, which is super exciting. Um, the animation is a little creepy. Uh, the cheetah has no head uh, and no tail. But yet it manages to run uh, essentially for forever, um, which is pretty exciting. Yeah, yeah, so I, <laughs> there were essentially two phases to this problem. The first involved a, a communication error between myself and, and Heiwan and Sangbei, where they told me that the, the ground deviation was in centimeters uh, when it was in meters. Oh, no, the other way around. So they told me it was in centimeters, or in meters. And I thought it was in centimeters. And so I had crazy ground first. So I was trying to optimize that. And then they said, that's impossible. There's no way you can get that to work. Um, and so then we got to something more sane. Uh, although this one is the, so this one is this, the same ground parameters as, uh, as the one that, that doesn't fail. <clears throat> so yeah, that's really exciting. And now I think we're going to get to, uh, I believe I've already beaten the best that they, that they had. Uh, tuned by hand. And now we're going to get to trying to tune more parameters, hopefully, uh, of the cheetah. And another problem that we're working on um, at the Broad Institute is really exciting. Um, so a protein synthesis, uh, protein binding problem, where the problem is essentially that, um, so Dr. Tarjay Mickelson has built this amazing protein synthesis um, space where they can synthesize large batches of proteins evaluate how well they bind against certain cells and not against other cells. And they essentially want to optimize in the space of proteins to find the one that binds best with, um, with a specific cell while not binding with something else, which is really important for, for things like drug delivery. Um, and so this is really exciting. It it's a, has a very different flavor because it's a very large discrete space. So proteins clearly are, are not continuous valued objects. Um, but they're long strings of categorical parameters. Um, so I guess four categories per character, which is kind of fun. And then there's a couple more, more problems that I, I guess I won't really talk about. Um, they also asked me not to disclose completely publicly. Yes? Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> In, in protein space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so, so that's really tricky. Um, we essentially have to optimize in protein space, um, which can be a, a big, maybe combinatorial optimization. Uh, that, that project is still very much in early days. So at the moment, it's a really interesting experimental design problem 
where we haven't started it yet, but we're working on proposing what the best first, first batch is to run. Um, and so what's really interesting is that this, this machinery can evaluate, uh, synthesize and evaluate tens of thousands of proteins in parallel. Um, and so our first, uh, although it takes about 10 days, I think, to do this. So our, our first thing is really to propose a really good set to start with. And so we've been thinking a lot about what is the best set of, of proteins to evaluate first, such that it will kind of bootstrap our, our optimization procedure. Um, but then, yes, how do you optimize a protein? Well, you could do, for example, an evolutionary type algorithm, so you adjust individual characters, um, or something more intelligent. We're thinking of trying to project the proteins into some kind of continuous space and then interpolating over that space. But it's super interesting. Yeah, we don't have we don't have the answer entirely yet. Um, all right. So it's the multitask work was with Kevin Swirsky. He's a student in Toronto. Um, I have to thank Google because they funded me for a while while I was doing this work. And then yes, all the code is online. Uh, you should definitely check it out. Uh, and I am in MD one ten, which is just down the hall right there. Uh, so if you have questions or you have a really exciting problem that you think kind of fits this, then definitely stop by. Uh, we have a dart board. Um, if you can beat me at darts, which will not be very difficult, then I will gladly try to optimize your problem. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so that's that's really uh, really interesting. Um, that's a great point. Let me see if I have extra slides to. No, I don't have the extra slides. So in in my thesis, I looked at uh, the case where you have a bounded horizon or you have some bounded cost, and a really kind of exciting scenario of that flavor is, say you have a, say you're working towards a paper deadline. And the NIPS deadline is in two weeks. What is the best set of experiments you can run before the NIPS deadline? And certainly, you can work out something better than saying, what is the next myopic one experiment to run next? Um, but it's super expensive to do this kind of forecasting. Well, my meal that I need my eggs for is one hour away. <laughs> How long can I spend? Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. And, and it certainly comes up with a different set of experiments when you do that.